or understand or learn from one another. Um, teams need to be able to select their own method because there are variations and there are also in the team, there are competences we want to take, uh, uh, to take care of. It doesn't mean that there still there need to be some practices, some way of working that we share, but a lot of things can be done differently. You can develop with waterfall, or you develop iteratively, you do ad drive. These things can vary between different teams, no problem. What we don't want to have different are things like architecture or uh, methods like component-based development and things like that. That we probably want to share. Methods need a new user experience. Developers don't read books. I have written or been a primary author of 11 books. People buy my books, which I'm very happy for. They don't read them. So I have to travel and talk about my books. Uh, I'm very happy, more than one million copies have been sold of these books. And this is about software. It's not about action and sex, it's software. So um, it's not bad. But as I said, they don't read them. Uh, you know yourself, you buy a book, you want to read it. So we, we need a completely new user experience than reading books, because we don't do that. And then another thing is that methods are usually, when I developed my first um, method outside Ericsson, where I worked for many years, and made it a methodology that was useful for, yeah, could be used for anything, you know. Not perfect for everything, but could be used for everything. And um, I was happy for every page more I could write about this method. So when I came up to 1,500 pages and added one more page, I was extremely happy because I could sell it. I sold one single book at that time for $22,500 per head. And I sold not so fantastic many, but at least 500. Uh, compared to um, Newton's Mathematica that you could buy at that time for $100,000, uh, 500 years old. It was a good price. So, uh, we need to have, we need to focus on the essence instead of focusing on everything you can say about how to develop software. Most books are of that nature, they try to be exhaustive, but no one learns exhaustive stuff. And then finally, the most important point here, up till to now, methods are dead books or websites. You can go to a website and, and, and learn, uh, read about the book, but it's dead. You put it in your head, and you then, if you remember it, it's good. Whereas the methodology should be there, help you in your daily work, give you guidance. You don't need to follow it, but at least you should get guidance based on the problem you have. So that is, uh, today. Now, method put you in method prisons. What do I mean by that? Let's look at the four very popular methodologies in, in Agile at scale. There are SAFE, which is uh, the absolute leader today. How many know about SAFE? So it's very few in this audience, but it's extremely popular. Uh, SPS, that is Scrum, scaled up by Ken Schwaber. Disciplined Agile Delivery, it's uh, Scott Ambler, and le Large Scale Scrum. These are four, there are many of them. In the Internet of, sp Internet of Things space, we have the Ignite methodology. I'll talk about that later, but 
Uh, it is not very different from what I'm going to talk about now. So uh, they are all monolithic. They are non-modular. You cannot not take a piece from one of them and use another one without making a major redesign. Uh, they have a lot in common, but you cannot see it. Because the author of every such, of a guru behind every such methodology has put some little special stuff to it. So if you use Scrum, it's not the same Scrum in all four. Because I know a little bit better, and that's how methodology has worked forever. They all have our unique own practices, but you cannot mix and match practice from them. If you select one, you are in a method prison, controlled by the guru of that method. It's just so crazy. And we are here after having developed software for 60 years. And it's like everybody thinks there is nothing we can do about it. This is the nature. May I, may I ask you, is there anyone else than I that think this is crazy? Uh, at least a few. It's definitely not small. So method prisons are not smart. How do we get out of method, method prisons? Okay. First of all, 60 years and we have, until now, not had anything that we can say is the common ground. Well, in computer science, we have a lot of common ground. But in software engineering, or system engineering, there is nothing we can point at until now that is the common ground. And the common ground includes the things that every method has, what every method helps you produce, what you always do. It's a starting point to understand software engineering. So look here, no common ground for 60 years. Two years ago, we got this new standard, a standard common ground. It was taken by object management group. It's called Essence. Essence consists of two things, a kernel and a language. They two together constitute the common ground in now in software engineering, but soon in systems engineering, because it's not a big difference. So the kernel consists of the essential things to work with, the thing you always work with. You may call them different things, but you always work with them. It's the essential things you always do, the essential competences you always need. Language is a very small visual language. Think UML. You know, how many know UML? Okay. If you think UML, it's a graphical notation. This is one hundred of the size of UML. It's a very small, efficient language. Intuitive. You learn it in one hour or two hours or something like that. So this is the essence, and it's an OMP standard. So essence is the common ground to build practices and method upon. So on top of essence, the kernel and the language, there are a layer of practices. And on top of practices, there is a layer of methods. This is a really important discovery we made 10 years ago. I think it was 11 years ago when I first said, a method is nothing but a composition of practices. The interesting is, um, there are in the world about 100
hundred thousand methods or more. Some of them are well known, but most of them are homemade. Every little team creates their own method, usually. But there are only about 250, no, more than 250, say 250 plus practices in the world that are identified. So the interesting thing, methodology, a method is just a composition of practices. If we can identify the practices, then we can easily create methods. So that is the discovery, and another discovery. So there are basically three things that are really new in this uh, concept. One is that there is a kernel that is universal for all the ways we work when we develop software, and as I said, very soon also systems. Then that on this kernel you can describe very efficiently practices, and then you can create your own way of working by composing practices. That was the three important uh, discoveries we made 11 years ago. So just to uh, see a little bit more, uh, here we make a schematic method. We have essence at the bottom, we select practices, and this is now a method that the team can use. So imagine that we have a library of practices. Imagine you have a library of practices that you can pick from. At the top here, we have identified your own practices, which you have in-house. You certainly have something that are pearls, and maybe most of them, most of, but most of what you have is really not uh, unique. But you have something, likely. And here in practice library, we have all the practices in SAFE, which I mentioned earlier. All the practices in discipline agile delivery, which I mentioned earlier. And all the practices in scale professional uh, scum. Now you have a practice library. And now a team or an organization select the practices they need for their particular problem, their particular product. They select these red ones, okay? You ignore the rest, and you create your own method. This is how it should work. This is how you should be able to get a team to do what they need to do in a very efficient way, and not offer them a method that they have difficulties to use. So in an organization, you can mix and match practices. So there is, uh, for instance, in team A at the bottom, you have uh, four practices on top of a kernel. Team B has three and use the same practice for requirements, namely use case, as team A, and so on. So in this way, you can build up uh, and you know what people are doing because they are modular. These things exist in the library. So, <clears throat> now I would like to talk a little about, we call it essentialize, when you describe a methodology on top of essence. You capture the essence of that methodology using this essence language and essence kernel. And we have done, not only we, uh, my company, but many others are doing that today. Many of the big companies are, are starting to use it. Uh, companies uh, in, in um, unfortunately, they don't want me to talk about them. I would love to talk about them, but uh, we are working with um, 12 companies that all are very sizable. You all know them uh, by name. And they are marching on this because they, disc they know the problem they have. It's not a sustainable situation they have. Their methods just grow because there is some individual in a team that become, want to become or is good at methods. But actually, this is a, an organization-wide initiative. So let's 
see, we have created a package called Agile Essentials. It includes, it's the basics if you want to go Agile. It includes basically Scrum and um, some other practices that you always have when you, uh, uh, which are very popular when you want to go Agile. And um, we have a, a practice library available to look at for anybody at our website. We have not launched it 100%. We have launched it in small, small steps. But it is there. And if you know the, how to get there, you can get there. Uh, it includes seven practices. And uh, it's the basics of Agile. Then we have another package, which is uh, 10 practices. Uh, and you know, every such practice is like a minimum effort. It's not the small thing. And I'll show you what it looks like. And, and uh, it is described, every such practice is described using poker sized cards. So here I'll show you. This is all the practices in Agile Essentials. Just a set of cards. And they are not only for looking at, they, you, you can play games with them. Games with your serious games, not trivial, valuable. Uh, people just love it. It's physical. They are good for training. They are good for, for small projects. When you scale up, you need to have an electronic version of it. And there is an, an electronic version of all this. So these cards are on every practice is described with the most important things in that practice. So in the past, we had uh, books with a lot of text. But we didn't find these elements that are the most critical for each practice. Not easily. And they are about, uh, I think uh, the number of elements you have are about five. So every practice is described with four, with, uh, four uh, different elements. And uh, typically, a practice is between five and maybe 15 such elements. A big practice can be up to 15. And that is normally represented by a book. You know, you have to think about it that way. So uh, the alternative is a book. It doesn't mean that the books are useless. It just means that you, what you really, when you've learned these elements, which you learn in a class, they sit there, and you go home with them. And you can start working in a team. Actually, in the classroom, you start to develop software using these cards. And then you can add stuff to it, and you can replace stuff. So we have practices, user stories is a very popular practice. Uh, continuous flow, that's basically Kanban uh, practice. So you can add practices to these, to these uh, small packs. Uh, the old un rationally unified process, which was my baby, is now captured on, what is it, six, eight practices. And each of these practices are, so it's a deck of cards, the same thing, 50 cards or something like that. That was once upon 3,000 pages. That's when I made $22,500 per, 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 per book. I regret that time. It was a good time. But it was also crazy. We didn't know it. Microservices. Is another such practice. DSDM. DSDM. Uh, is there anyone here that know DSDM? Yeah. So it's a UK, very popular, old method. They have decided to totally redesign what we have. And they created something they call ABC. And ABC stands for Agile Business uh, Center or something like that. And it is. And that methodology will be designed using essence from the beginning. So they are not going to re-engineer. They are going to design it from the beginning using essence. Scrum is there. Scrum is <coughs> about 15 cards. 
So scum is, and these are all essential elements to do scum. And here we have sinks. This is the most popular method framework today. Uh, the guy who has done it is a very good friend of mine, Dean Leffingwell. We worked together for seven years uh, at Ratchet Software. When uh, RUP was very popular, he was actually responsible for RUP. And uh, now he has done something which is uh, a very up to date in the agile world. Very popular. But look at this picture. It's loaded. It's loaded with information. You have to really study, and, and then you click on symbols here, you dive deeper and deeper. It's a beautiful way of presenting a very complex methodology, but it could be done even better. So we have actually, since uh, SAFE is trademark and copyright, we cannot publicly uh, present what we have done. Uh, we have redesigned the whole thing with 14 practices. And um, one day I will talk to Dean about it, but it's too early. Uh, so I will wait till, till, uh, till uh, we have uh, a lot of other people on board. Uh, and this is another way to represent it. It's the kernel at the bottom. It's a number of practices that are not specific for SAFE. They are generic practices. And then there is a layer of practices on top. Completely more structured way. And, and then you can dive deep into it and, and re get the same thing. But, um, and you can, of course, add books to this. You can add a lot of stuff. But the basics is very simple. We have done Ignite together with the father, fathers or parents of Ignite. Ignite is, uh, how many know about Ignite? Okay, Ignite, <laughs> I'm surprised because this is a methodology developed for Internet of Things. And um, uh, we have been working with the fathers of Ignite. You know, it's a huge methodology. Look at how much uh, there is in the generic space, which is impossible for them to describe uh, themselves. Now they can take existing practices from a library and just build on top of that. On top of that, there is a huge number of other practices. So uh, uh, this is the way we have been working. This is not ready yet. This is work in progress. But uh, Dirk Slammer, who is a famous man in, in this group, uh, internet, Industrial Internet, uh, works with us. On the, and he is uh, one of the fathers of this methodology. So it will happen. You see that uh, uh, these are three different practices from this methodology, described on these kind of uh, cores. Uh, this describes how you actually develop the big picture. And I, I will not go deep into this since there is basically no one here that knows about it, which is, of course, surprising <laughs> given that we are at the uh, internet. So now, What I've told you is that I think the situation in this industry is just crazy. How we develop software is, uh, I mean, it's under, under the value of us. We deserve much better. So what is the value proposition of this? Well, that in itself is so huge. So I could spend at least a couple of hours just talking about what is the value. But I'll give you some ideas. So essence, this is basically the key important part of the kernel. This is the kernel in, uh, in more detail. Um, it describes the key elements that every project deals with. There is always requirements. There is always a, a system to build. There is always work to do. There is always a way of working. 
there is always um, a team, at least one team. And there is always an opportunity. Why do we do it? And there are always stakeholders. This simple picture is not clear to most development teams. Most development teams don't know there need to be stakeholders. Most, I said, not every. They don't know there need to be stakeholders. And they don't care, because they can develop a software without having any stakeholders. The best products in the world are built without stakeholders. When I started to work at Ericsson, 100 years ago or so, uh, I talked to our, we, we had now a new division developing software, uh, developing switching systems based on software. And the um, people working well to develop switching software. I remember one conversation, uh, one guy said, if we didn't need to deal with this application software, we could build the best system in the world. So they all wanted to build operating system. They all wanted to build a database management system and computer. But the applications connecting subscriber to subscriber was really the most boring thing they could do. But they had to do it. Of course, that changed over time. But it was the beginning of that era. So uh, we have a kernel. and. The kernel can be used to uh, create practice descriptions, as I just told you. You build practices on top of a kernel, the language and the elements in the kernel. But the, what is really new here is that it also can help you apply the practices, meaning the, kernel, the, 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 the methodology you have is not a dead one, it's not a book, but actually it helps you to guide you in what to do next, all the time. So it's a very active, uh, active kernel. So what is the major impact of Essence? What does it do to you? What would it do to you if you have a big company? I must admit that smaller companies can survive without doing this, but the, at the end, they will benefit. Universities are adopting it because for the first time, in the history of software engineering at universities. A professor can teach what software engineering is without having to teach one specific methodology. If you go around and ask professors what they are teaching, they teach Scrum, XP, Kanban. We are very proud we teach Kanban. I mean, it's one specific instance of a methodology that university professors in best cases teach. If you go to the more prestigious university, they really don't teach software engineering. They teach some academic, interesting, formal methods. It's good stuff, but it's not something industry needs. So here, there are two major eff effects. You move from being a craft to being industrial scale engineering. We use industrial uh, practices. We have a lot of uh, um, tooling, good tooling to support the work, and there is uh, science behind it. It basically stands on top of a theory, which is, you know, I am very skeptical to theories because most theory, theories are useless. But I love one statement. There is nothing as practical as a good theory. I mean, we wouldn't be able to travel around the world without good theories, for sure. So um, good theories and industrial scale engineering. The other is that you forever create a learning organization in a company. Because there is a practice library. You change the practices as you learn more. People can go and access practices from wherever they work. So they are not in prisons of one particular way of working. So here are some things that, uh, to go a little more in detail, uh, I'm a little afraid to, to, to go through this because um, it is a lot. But basically, if you go to the left side here, 
the value in preparing for work when you start to think about how to do it. You have a common ground. You have a library of practices. You can mix and match practices. You can put together the methodology you want to have as a team. And you can share new practices, new ideas can easily be introduced. Uh, in the past, every new idea required redesign of everything else. What has happened to, the, I mean, first of all, let me say, I'm 100% supporter of Agile. Let's see, I'll, I'll quickly, so I can, 100% supportive of Agile. But um, uh, Agile, when it started, threw away everything we knew about architecture. Architecture was bad. And many other good things got out through the back door. So uh, here it's easy to add new practice without redesigning everything else. So it's, uh, and while you work, you get guidance in your daily work. What are you going to do next? And that is because uh, there are state machines that you follow. These cards have states and help you. And it's, uh, it, people love it when they work with it in practice. It's futurized. You know, less than 20% of the work we do when we develop software is really creative. Most of it we do, we do if we follow patterns. We know exactly where we end up after having worked uh, a day. <coughs> so, um, it's 80% is no brain work. Uh, it's expected that at least 50% of these noble brain work can be taken over by intelligent agents. And basically every practice will then be supported by intelligent, I mean, ex a small expert system. And that is, uh, uh, so you have an agent, this is actually a slide that is 15 years old. I uh, developed uh, an intelligent agent system uh, for, for many of these things. So what is the expectation today? So many of these companies that now jump onto this, they have no evidence that this will really make a difference. We cannot show a whole bunch of case studies because it will take five years to get a really good case study. So, um, but the expectation, this is from one single company, a company with 300,000 employee uh, uh, software developers. We can do twice as good a job, twice as fast, with half a people, and still you can make your customers more happy. What choice do we have? So welcome to the future. Uh, by the way, at the bottom here you see, uh, this is where you can find my slide deck, if you're interested in finding that. So, uh, as I said, welcome to the future. This is, um, uh, and now I can take questions. <laughs> okay, no question. I have something to tell you. Uh, you know that the title of my talk talked about smarter methods, smarter. So, uh, I would like to understand, have you understood what uh, smarter, how many think they understood what smarter means? Uh, no one. Ah, one, two. It's too bad. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure I will never ever be invited here again. Let me, let me tell you a little uh, what it means to be smart, okay? Because smart and intelligent are not the same. Uh, two fools were standing uh, at the curbside of a street and they were talking about how to become rich and they had no solution. And at that very moment a guy in a Lamborghini came driving up and parking the car on the curbside and when he's stepping out, a young guy, you know, smart, dressed, uh, they, uh, one fool said to him, he must know how to become rich. I'll ask him. So 
he goes over to the guy and say, Sir, I understand you, you are rich. Can you tell me how to become rich? Sure, I can. And he took the guy over to, to a, a tr tree and he put his trunk, a hand in front of the trunk of a tree and said, Hit me. Hit me as hard as you can. Oh, no, no, I cannot do that. Do you want to learn how to be rich? Oh, yes, sir. So hit me as hard as you can. So he, the fool, he, he, he hit as hard as he could. But of course, just as he was about to hit the hand, the rich man removed the hand and he hit the trunk. And the rich man said, this is what it means to be, to be small. And he walked away. The poor guy, he woke over to his friend and he said, he said, uh, the friend asked, do you know how to be rich? Yes, I know. I'll show you. And he looked around, but, but he couldn't find a tree. So he said, hit me, hit me as hard as you can. So how many know what it means to be smart? <laughs> okay, uh, let's go for smarter methods, right? Welcome, and you're very welcome to, to uh, talk to me, and I'm sure we will change the world. Thank you very much.